one of the themes in uh, Dance Floor Thunderstorm uh, that I wanted to return to was the fact that the rave scene for the last basically 20 plus years has gotten very short shrift uh, in the media. I'm talking about the mainstream you know, uh, media here, not the electronic music press. Um, it really bothered me back in the 90s um, when I was neck deep in the rave scene in this wonderful, um, you know, embracing, hyper positive, you know, culture um, with the best dance music in the world and, you know, um, the entertainment value that went absolutely through the roof. Um, and that then in the mainstream media, we would find these stories that um, were very, uh, for the most part, very one-sided and very slanted anti-electronic music. Um, a lot of these uh, stories were very sensationalist uh, in nature uh, with very little actual investigation as to what has, was actually going on, you know, in raves. Um, there used to be a, a catchphrase in the news business. Uh, you might remember it. It's called, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what drove a lot of uh, investigative news, you know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, you know, in 2000s. And um, particularly with shows like uh, Hard Copy and Inside Edition, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, these stories that would appear in these shows, most of the time, bore very little resemblance to reality. You know, they almost none of them actually made the effort to find out what was actually going on in raves and all the positive aspects to it. It was more like, you know, a very sensationalist, you know, do you know where your children are, you know, sort of thing, you know. And uh, yeah. and, that, and I'd gone to school for broadcast journalism, so I knew, you know, I'd interned, you know, at news stations and stuff. I knew how this whole thing worked. And so when I first really discovered the rave scene in 96, I had remembered all these, you know, stories that had been popping up, you know, and I knew based on how they worked that either something really horrible was going on, you know, in the rave scene, or maybe, just maybe, these guys have got this thing ass backwards, right. you know, and uh, I strongly suspected the latter. And uh, when I began investigating raves for myself in the spring of 96, uh, that suspicion was proven to be correct, at least as far as I was concerned. And uh, that's when I realized what it, uh, an incredible... Uh, community this was a very underground community uh, but with the best dance music in the world and um, the thing was just growing you know every year and I knew in my gut in the even at the very beginning I knew in my gut that this thing was going to go somewhere I had nothing to base that on because uh, I knew nobody you know in the scene at yeah. that point I didn't know how the whole thing worked but I managed to insert myself into the center of the whole thing here in LA. And, and you have to remember in the, in the mid and late 90s, Southern California pretty much became the center for raving culture in North America. I mean, it was all over the continent, obviously, but the LA became the center and uh, it was the core. And so I was very lucky to be able to insert myself into that core at exactly the right time, you know, because yeah. it gave me access to people like Pasquale over at Insomniac, you know, back when Insomniac was just another mid-level player. You know, right. they weren't the, the juggernaut that they are today. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, my timing was very, very good, and um, it, um, it was an amazing era, an yeah. absolutely amazing era.